you have your Bibles tonight, if you can take them and turn to Daniel chapter 3, please. Daniel chapter 3. All right, we're in Daniel chapter 3. What story are we going to look at tonight? Not Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Susie knows her Bible. All right. Wonderful. We've been talking about difficult times in our life and how do we react when we go through difficulties and fiery trials that we're going to see here tonight. And, you know, the, the normal thing for a Christian to do, for the human being to do, is to just try to hide from the trials and to run from them and to, to seek refuge in anywhere but God. And what God is showing us, we'll see again here tonight, that in our Christian life, the closer we grow, grow to the Lord, we need to be able to depend on Him and trust in Him during those times. And if we do, we'll find a refuge that there is nothing like Him in the world. There is nothing that this world can offer you that is anything like our God. And so while the world will run to alcohol, the world will run to psychologists and counselors and whatever it might be to try to get the answers of life, true freedom and true joy and true peace can only be found in Jesus Christ. And that's what we're going to see here in Daniel chapter 12 tonight. We're going to talk about one of the greatest accounts in the Bible of overcoming insurmountable odds. Last week we were together, we looked at the story of David and Goliath and how little David beat Goliath, and it was a miracle that day. But Daniel is now in the land of Babylon, along with the, all the captives uh, from Judah. What uh, Nebuchadnezzar did is when he went into Judah and Jerusalem there, before he destroyed it, he captured all of the people that were of any value to the kingdom of Jerusalem. And uh, he captured a lot of those Jewish young boys, and they were very smart. They were taught to be astronomers. They were taught the sciences and so Nebuchadnezzar used them in the kingdom. And I don't know what the conversation was like when that 600-mile journey between Jerusalem and Babylon, but I can only imagine as the children of God, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Daniel, boys that were brought up to fear the God of the Bible, as they traveled that journey from Jerusalem to the pagan capital at that time, Babylon, what they would have talked about. Now, we get to Daniel chapter 3, and you know the story, most of you, if you've been to Sunday school before, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. You've heard that story before, but what the Bible doesn't tell us is the events that led up to this in the life of these men. Now, there probably had been plenty of opportunity for them to decide what they were going to do if the day finally came that they had to choose between serving God and serving men. And I, and I share this as we get into the scripture this, this evening, Faithway family. The whole COVID shutdown thing in the country has really brought a lot of people um, to the point where they have to choose between a government that is overreaching or a government uh, of the people, by the people, for the people. Which is it going to be? And if there comes a time in which the government tells Christians that they cannot worship for whatever reason it might be, it's kind of been eye-opening to me how many Christians have said, oh, well, you know, the government doesn't recommend we worship right now, so we're just not going to worship. We're going to kind of stay away because that's what the government says to do. Unfortunately, there are a lot of Christians who don't take the command of God not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as something that's very serious. You can't be a Christian and island unto yourself. It just doesn't work that way. God created you to be around a group of people and to worship together. And I can guarantee you that there is coming a day in our country in which we are going to have to take a stand whether or not we are going to serve God or we're going to listen to the edicts of the government. And it may not be a pandemic, it may be something else that comes along the line, but there will be a day in which we're going to have to choose, are we going to serve God or are we going to serve man? Um, if someone says to you, well, you know, the church shouldn't be involved in politics. I, I love it when someone says that because... Yes, I'm not as your pastor ever going to get up and say, Bruce, vote Republican, or make sure you vote Democrat, or you need to vote Libertarian. I'm not going to get up and tell you necessarily what party to vote for. But I will tell you there, is a, there are truths and there are absolutes. And when it comes to what is life, we all know life begins at conception, don't we? And everybody out there in the world, if they were truly honest with their conscience, they know what they are doing when they kill a little baby. They know that they're killing a baby when they have an abortion. They know it, but they choose to hide it. And when the Bible says life begins at conception, then that is a life and death issue. It is a moral issue. It's a, 
it's not a choice between what is, you know, the better party. It's a choice between what party stands for life and what party stands for death. Do you understand? And so as a church, we're not advocating one political party or over another. What we're saying is, what does the Bible say about marriage? What does the Bible say about life? What does the Bible say about social issues? Find out what the Bible says, and then you find a candidate that says, this is what we believe, and we're going to go that direction. You cannot divorce politics and the Bible. It just does not work. Someone says, well, we got to have the separation of church and state. You're not going to find that anywhere in the Constitution, and you definitely won't find that in the Bible. The, the founders of our country were religious men who loved God and feared God. And so Daniel chapter 3, we have some very religious men who had a long journey from, Bab- from Jerusalem to Babylon. They knew they were going to be into a, uh, going into a situation where they were one day most likely going to have to make a decision. Are we going to serve the king or are we going to serve God? And I would venture to say that the decision that we see, the, the, the passion that they had to take a stand for God, wasn't something that just popped in all of a sudden into their heads. No, this was a resolution that they had in their mind that they were going to serve the God of the Bible, let come what may. And so, Christian, my challenge to you this, this evening is, whatever the government tells you to do, make sure you obey God rather than men. You say, well, it's easy to say, right? Yes, it's easy to say it, but it's a whole lot harder to do it when push comes to shove. When, you know, in China, if you decide that you're going to take a stand for God, they're going to label you and put a mark on you as someone that is going against the communist system, and it makes it very difficult for you to buy and for you to sell and for you to participate in the government's run healthcare system and the government run market. And so there's coming a day that it will happen in America, if not in my generation, probably within my kids' generation. And so we need to resolve right here, right now, today, with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that when faith leads us through the fiery furnace, we're going to take a stand, even if it costs us our life. So as we continue looking at this passage of Scripture, we know the story, right? King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. Babylon at that time was the most powerful country in the entire world. It was the place, like the United States, the superpower. Babylon was the superpower. And King Nebuchadnezzar created a golden image that stood 90 feet tall. Now, these ceilings are like 20, I think they're like 20 feet tall if you go all the way to the top, right? 90 feet, four and a half times the height of the ceiling. That's a pretty incredible idol. And this idol made, made out of gold, that's a ton of gold, right? Tons and tons of gold. And a command was given throughout all of the province there in Babylon that all should come and bow and worship the image that the king made as soon as they hear the trumpet, the music being played. And these young men, who were committed to serve God from a very early age, and him alone, knowing that they would face the wrath of the king, these men said, no, we can't worship a false idol. We will not bow to an image made by man. Now, I have yet to see a 90-foot golden idol erected anywhere in America. Maybe there's one that exists. But, you know, we don't face that struggle per se right now. But the pressures to conform to the dictates of society and the pressure to abandon our faith are continuing to increase. I mean, if you're on social media, you know that they limit you. You know that they've done to our church and they've restricted certain sermons that we've sent out and that we've published. It's just a matter of time. And the pressure to cave is there. And like these men, we are rapidly, as Christians, becoming a minority in society today. Our world is distancing themselves from the Lord, and the pressures to adhere to the philosophies of the world continue to increase. And so like the men of old, we must remain committed to the Lord, knowing that God is able to give us the strength that we need during that difficult time in our life to take a stand whatever happens. And so tonight, Daniel chapter 3, if you have your Bibles, let's take a look at what happens to a Christian when faith will lead him or her through the fire. First of all, I want you to notice the confrontation that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had regarding the king's command. Verse number 12. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, that's a mouthful right there, but uh, I've never met anyone named Shadrach, Meshach, or Abednego, but uh, more power to their moms. They're, actually, their names, that, that's not their given Hebrew name. That would have been the name given to them um, when they came to Babylon. These men, O king, 
have not regarded thee, they serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. So you know what those people are, right? They're, they're people who are basically ratting out Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're the neighbors who are, are, are tattletailing on Shadrach, right? And so as the music is played, the multitudes have gathered there to the public square all around Babylon there, and everybody bows, but these men refuse. They remain steadfast in their faith. They refuse to bow, and it doesn't take long until their refusal to honor the king is noticed by other people. Now, early on in their lives, if you look at verse number 12, the beginning of it, certain Jews whom thou, talking to the king, hast set up over the affairs of the province of Babylon. So, early on in their lives, they had been groomed to take over positions of leadership within the kingdom of Babylon. And there's no doubt in my mind that this brought increased scrutiny from the Babylonians. And as soon as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego decided, I'm not going to bow the knee, their refusal was immediately brought to the attention of the king. And these advisors sought to make their a refusal uh, personal with the king, right? Lord, our king, uh, thou, thou hast set up these men and you've given them positions of honor and they've disregarded you. They've ignored you. They've dissed you, right? They, they have disrespected what you commanded them to do. By the way, they are, those are committed those that are committed to serving the Lord today. So if you decide I'm going to take a stand for God, whether it's at work, at home, in the neighborhood, whatever it might be, you are watched very closely by people around you. You know why? The world rejects our faith. And the world will seek any opportunity that it can to accuse us before other people. You know, it's always a tragedy whenever you hear of a pastor that falls into moral sin. But you know what the media loves to do as soon as there's a scandal, right? The front page on the Washington Post, or it's a front page headline whenever there's a scandal that erupts within a church. Why do they do that? Why don't they do that for your neighbor that's involved in, a, in an extramarital affair? They, they don't do that to them. Why don't they? Well, there's no salacious gossip that is there. But the devil loves to ruin and any attempt that he can to try to drag the bride of Christ through the mud. He's going to do that. And so that's why 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 12 says, Yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, and many will attempt to take our obedience to the Lord and make it appear as if it's a direct attack um, on certain individuals who are in leadership. Opposition is sure for those who are committed to serving the Lord. The Bible makes that clear. So the first thing we see is they are confronted because of their refusal to submit to the king, his command that was unbiblical. But I want you to notice verse number 14. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that, ye serve, uh, that do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now this is pretty phenomenal here. These three men... They are ushered into the presence of the king of the greatest country in the world at that time. And the king obviously knew of them. He put them in positions of leadership. And so they have this personal audience one-on-one -on -one with the king. And I mean, I can't help but think that normally such, I, I guess it would be disrespect if you want to call it that, would not be an issue that the king would handle himself, right? It would be dealt with by his minions and it would just be taken care of and they would probably be executed and nobody would even know be the wiser, the king especially. But the Bible tells us here they have a direct audience with the king. And he heard the accusations and he was determined, I want to figure out what's going on with my three advisors. Why aren't they bowing the knee and obeying what I told them to do? Now, you and I may never be forced to stand before the authorities because of our faith. But then again, we might. Because believers in Jesus Christ are no longer a majority in America. And throughout the world, they definitely, we are definitely outnumbered. Many who reject the Lord desire to weaken our faith and intimidate those who are committed to the Lord. And so the king says, what's going on? And if you'll notice in verse number 15, he gives them an, a, one more opportunity. Nebuchadnezzar says to these guys, if ye be ready, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, I always thought that was kind of an interesting instrument, the sackbut, what in the world is that? Until a couple of years ago, we were in Phoenix, and uh, they have a museum there of mu mu uh, musical instruments from all around the world. I mean, we're talking thousands and thousands of instruments. 
And uh, we're going around, and you hit the button, and you can hear every instrument being played electronically, you know. And, and we're going, we go to one display, and there's a sack butt. I'm like, it does exist. There is such a thing as a sack butt. And I guess it's uh, from the Middle East, kind of like a little guitar or a little harp that they would play over there during that time. But there is such thing. So you have the, the flute, the harp, the sack butt, the psaltery, the dulcimer, all kinds of music. When you hear these things, you fall down and you worship the image which I have made. Well, but if you worship not, here's the punishment, you shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is God? That, who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hand? So whatever patience the king had at this point, right, wherever he's at, he is now wearing that patience very thin. And King Nebuchadnezzar assures them, your rebellion and your disobedience is not going to be tolerated anymore. This is one final opportunity. I've given you the best that Babylon has to offer. I've given you a position of, of authority. You've disrespected me personally by not worshiping the idol that I made. So I'm going to give you guys one more choice. Two options, right? You can either burn or you can bow. Which one is it going to be? And then at the end of that verse, if you look at it in verse 15, he throws in a little bit of sarcasm. If you don't bow, we're going to see. Is your God able to deliver you? Kind of like a challenge, right? The king of this earth, the God of this earth versus the God of the Bible. Let's see who's going to win. And you know how the story goes, but just for sake of our time together tonight, let's pretend like you don't know the end of the story. Because there is a reality for many believers around the world who are forced to choose between their lives and serving God. And most Christians who give their life on the foreign field, mission field, wherever it may be around the world, when they have to choose between serving God or off with your head, they're going to take a stand and they're going to serve the Lord up until the very end. We don't face that persecution in America, but it may very well come to that one day. One thing is certain, though, society declares that we must bow to their philosophies or we must face its wrath. You see that over and over and over again, and I guarantee you, they will come. One of the ways they're going to target the churches, I can guarantee you this, is they're going to go after our tax-exempt status. They're going to say, well, if you're a church and you continue to espouse um, the doctrines of hate, right, regarding marriage and regarding different things, the Bible makes very clear, then we're going to say you no longer are exempt from taxes. Okay, they'll go after that. They'll probably, they, there's certain allowances, things they give to pastors and different things that make a huge blessing for ministries. They're going to go after those things, and then they're going to start saying, that is a place of hate. It's a place of intolerance. We're going to close down the doors because we do not tolerate hateful places like that in our culture. Right now, you say that would never happen. Well, you've heard about the Christian businesses that are being sued because they say, well, we have a biblical, this is what the Bible says about marriage, and because I am a baker and I, have, I believe the Bible to be true, I am not going to do this. Or as a photographer, I will not participate in this. And they make a choice based upon their biblical convictions for standing to the Word of God and adhering to Christian principles, and the world mocks them and that sometime they, sometimes they are forced to go along with that, otherwise they lis, risk losing their business license and being forced out of business. And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were commanded to worship this false god, but I love what they do in verse number 16. In their mind, they had already decided what they were going to do. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, look at your text, verse 16, answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. Now, I guess that's the old English way of saying, look, we're very, we're, we're, we're going to be, we're going to be respectful in the way that we answer you, but we're going to do this such with boldness because we have no hesitation in what we are about to declare to you. In other words, their minds were made up. It's not like they were waffling back and forth and trying to figure out, well, what are we going to do, Shadrach? It's, should we just bow and go along with the flow? No, it wasn't in their mind. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, we, we don't have to think about it. We can tell you right now what we are going to do. And we as a church need this deep, settled faith. Our commitment to the Lord and faith in Him should be so strong and convicting that if, the, if it were coming down to it where you had to choose between 
giving up your life for God or walking out those doors a free person, you would say without hesitation, I will give my life for the cause of Christ. And I would encourage you to become settled in that, in what you believe, and committed to the Lord during peaceful times so you will know that you will stand when the trouble does come. We don't have to pray, let's put it this way, a true child of God should not have to pray about being committed to Christ. We shouldn't have to ponder what we would do, how would we be expected to behave when there comes an opportunity for us to choose a way contrary to our faith. So they decided, King, we're going to be respectful, but we don't even have to think about it. Look at verse 17. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O King. But if not, be it known unto thee, O King, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. This is a genuine picture of faith in the Lord. They declared, our God, we know that he is able to deliver us. In fact, we're confident that he will deliver us. But, in verse 18, if he chooses not to deliver us from the fiery furnace then we would rather die than serve your gods and the image and worship the image that you have made. You know what that tells me about these three guys? The three amigos, the three stooges, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What does it tell us about them? They were totally surrendered to the Lord. They were confident in his will for their life. Now, it's easy to proclaim that faith. Yep, Count me in, Pastor. I am on fire for God. When it comes to it, when someone walks in here with a gun and says, you know, choose Jesus or a bullet, I, I, I'm going to choose a bullet, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die for my faith. It's easy to proclaim that faith, but it's difficult to possess that faith. You say, how do I know that? Because there's a guy in the Bible, Peter, James, and John, the three closest friends of Jesus, Peter. What did Peter do the moment he had an opportunity to take a stand and testify of his faith in Christ. You remember what he did? When the rooster crowed three times that night, he had denied his faith in Christ. When he was questioned under pressure, under the threat of possibly losing his life because he was associated with Jesus Christ, Peter caved in. He did not stand. And Peter was someone who had walked with God for three and a half years. He had been the best friend of Jesus Christ. And Peter caved during that time. I'll tell you this, a casual encounter once a week with God on Sunday morning will not produce that type of faith. You want a faith that will stand the fiery trials of life. It is a faith that must be developed day in and day out you got to know the Bible. you got to spend time in prayer. You have to have a relationship with Jesus Christ that is closer than any human relationship that you have here on this earth. You must know him and know his face if you want to be steadfast during trials in your life. Well, you know how the story goes. In verses 19 through 23, um, they, they were defiant to the king, and it took great courage in the face of the fiery furnace. By the way, can you imagine what it would be like to be thrown into a fiery furnace? There's some archaeological records. We don't have this exact fiery furnace, but there, there are some archaeological records that exist about something similar to this where we believe it was a type of capital punishment. Like, you know, capital punishment it would be electric chair or it would be the injection, lethal injection. Used to be hanging, right? Drawn and quartered and all that stuff, right? That's how they used to do it. Fiery furnace would be a brutal way to die where they would heat up this metal box, and they would heat it up to such an immense that anything that you threw in there would instantly just be burned alive. If all the ways to die, I think I fear burning the probably the worst. I just the, the fear of that. I don't want to burn to death. I don't think anyone here wants to either. It'd just be so, so much pain. And that's the way that the Babylonians kept their people in check by threat of capital punishment versus via the fiery furnace. And here was a man or three men that were determined, I will die the worst possible death imaginable, being burned alive because of my faith. And the Bible tells us in verses 19 through 23 that these men, when the trumpet sounded, they still refused to bow. And so as a result of that, they were bound, 
with their clothes on, and they were cast into the furnace. And the fire was so hot, the Bible tells us, that the three men, or the men rather, that cast Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fire, they perished, they died, because the heat coming from the furnace entrance was so intense. All right, here's the question for you tonight. Do you possess that kind of faith? Are you willing to give your life for the cause of Christ if necessary? I know that's a very sobering question to ask, but it must be answered in your life. You know why? Because I am convinced that there are dark days ahead for the church of Jesus Christ. And only those who are abiding in the word and committed to Christ are going to endure. So verses 23, in verse number 23, they're, they're cast there into the fiery furnace. But I want you to notice in verse number 24 what happens. Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished. Or verse 23, these men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down into the midst of the fire, the fiery furnace. And Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake unto his counselors. Did we not cast three men bound in the midst of the fire? And they answered and said unto the king, True, O king. Look at verse 24. He answered and said, or 25, he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. You know what we discover here? When someone is committed to God, God honors that commitment to him. And although they faced certain death, Jesus Christ did not forsake them. He said, how do you know it was Jesus? Because right in verse number four, or right, right into verse number 25, the very end of that verse, the king says, there are four men who are on the fire, and that fourth man is like unto the Son of God. We believe that this is an Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ himself. I will not leave thee, I will not forsake thee. And although they faced death, that was for sure it was going to happen. They were not alone in the middle of that fire. The Lord was there with them. And as Nebuchadnezzar, the king, looks into the fiery furnace, he can't believe what he's seeing with his eyes. He questions his advisors and he says, how many did we throw into the fire? And they say, king, it's only three guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those are the only ones. And the king admits the fourth was like unto the Son of God. You know, tomorrow, you and I have no idea what we will face. The phone could ring at midnight tonight, and you could get some tragic news that will rock your world for the rest of your life. We have no idea what we will face tomorrow, but we do have the assurance that we will never be forced through the trials of our faith alone. I want to remind you tonight that Jesus will always be there for his children. Regardless of what we, we face, he will never leave us and he will never forsake us. In fact, he's gone, the Bible says, to prepare a place for us. And one day, either you will face death or you will be raptured up in the church. One day, you will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. He's gone to prepare a place for you and he's going to call every believer unto himself. What a day that's going to be when we see Jesus face to face. I want you to notice the end of this passage of Scripture. Look at verse number 26. And Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, you servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. All right, then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, what do they do? They come walking out of the fiery furnace, the midst of the fire. And the princes and the governors and the captains and the king's counselors being gathered together saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was a hair of their head singed, neither were their coats charged, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. You know, we have in the back of our, our yard, we have a fire pit, and Isaac and his buddies like to put a little fire in the fire pit from time to time. And whenever Isaac has been lighting a fire in that fire pit and roasting marshmallows, and he comes into the house, I can always tell that he's been around fire. How can we tell? Because of his clothes and the smoke that are on his clothes, right? They stink. And there's that charring smell just from being around fire. Can you imagine being in the midst of fire? Like your clothes, they don't even smell, the Bible says, the end of verse number 27. Not even the smell, smell of smoke. Keep in mind, the, the soldiers that threw them in, 
They were the ones who had perished, right? But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego survived the furnace, and they were able to walk out under their own power with no visible damage from the fire or from the smoke. Their garments weren't charred. If you had been one of the governors or the advisors that were there and witnessed that these, event, these events, um, if, if you hadn't seen it with your own eyes, there would be no way to prove that these men had encountered the fire at all. That's how amazing our God is. And what that shows us about our God who is in heaven is that he is awesome in power and he is full of grace and he loves and cares for those who serve him. And God is able to deliver us from even the most impossible situation that you face. So my friend, can I encourage you when the phone call rings or, or when the doctor calls or when you get some news that just absolutely breaks your heart and you find yourself in the pit of despair, wandering and wondering and questioning, where, where is God? Can I remind you that these men remain faithful to God and God met their need? And if you remain faithful to the Lord, he will meet your needs as well. I can remember a pastor preaching on this passage of scripture when I was in college, and I thought this was the greatest alliterated outline ever from it. I wrote it in my college Bible. He said this, they didn't bow, they didn't bend, and they didn't burn. I love that, right? They didn't bow, they didn't bend, and they didn't burn. And Jesus Christ is more than able to provide for us, even in the face of certain defeat. He's able to deliver us from the trials and the burdens that we face and is faithful to meet us. Where does he meet Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? In the midst of the fiery furnace. So tonight, are you going through a fiery furnace of your own? If not, tomorrow you may be. Next month, next year, something's going to happen this year that will be a fiery furnace to you. Jesus doesn't meet you outside on the back end, the tail end of the fiery furnace when you come out. He meets you right in the middle. And you know what Satan's going to tell you? He's going to whisper into your ear, your ear, and the world will tell you there is no way that you're going to be able to survive this. You're going to be destroyed by this. This thing is going to be your doomsday. But I want to remind you what the Lord said. He said something otherwise than that. He said in John chapter 10, Jesus said, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my hand. The illustration is this. When you got saved, this is the hand of God. And when you got saved, God placed you into his hand, and his hand enclosed about you, and he's got such a grip on you that no matter what happens, you could find the strongest person in the world. There is nothing that can separate you from the love of God. You cannot be removed from his hand no matter what trial comes your way. So tonight, I want to remind you the Lord is faithful to those who are in the body of Christ, who are part of his family. If you're struggling, come to him and find help and strength that you need during this difficult time in your life. If there's never been a time in your life when you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you face a storm that is greater than the fiery furnace. You face the wrath of God for all of eternity. But God loves you. He sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for your sins. And if you ask him to be your savior and repent of your sins, the Bible says God will place you into his hand. And no one will ever be able to pluck you out of that hand. And not only will God keep you through the fiery trials here on this earth, but God is going to take you and he's going to lead you into the promised land. He's going to lead you into heaven one day. And what a day it will be when we see our king. Let's pray together. Father, we look at the world around us and we realize that fiery trials um, are going to happen. Whether it's corporately as a church in America or whether it's the fiery trials of life in general. There are many times, Lord, when we, we look at these things that come our way and we say, this obstacle, this thing that's in my life is insurmountable. There's no way we'll be able to overcome it. And Satan whispers, yep, this is it. It's your doomsday. It's your defeat. Lord, help us to remember that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And no one can pluck us out of the Father's hand. Give us strength, I pray, Lord, to be able to live a life pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
Well, you survived an entire message with us today. Thank you for watching. We appreciate it. And uh, we trust the video today has been a blessing to you. You know, every message that I preach, I always try to bring it back to the importance of, number one, telling people everywhere we go about Jesus Christ. And number two, making sure that we as individuals make our life with God, our personal walk with God, the most important thing of our day. If there's ever anything that we can do for you or your family to help you grow in your walk with Jesus Christ, would you please reach out to us? You can visit our website, visitfaithway.com, and there you'll find a link to get in touch with us. And we'd love to hear from you. If you made a decision to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior today, awesome, that's wonderful. We would love to be able to talk to you about that and give you some resources that can help you grow in your walk with God. So let us know if there's ever anything that we can do for you. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day.